today I want to take a look at a uh, series of presentations I did. Uh, and this one was based on great authors. So I put together kind of three or four different presentations uh, that I could have every month that, we, um, that were based on authors that I consider some of the greats. And uh, this was on Jack London. And so for uh, this presentation, I wanted to take a look at a short story uh, by Jack London called To Build a Fire. Uh, this was for advanced students, uh, so you might do this with university students or in a, in a trading center uh, where you have maybe a mixed, uh, a mixed a variety of proficiencies. Um, but I did this as an English corner and also as something uh, w uh, was considered... Uh, one of the companies I worked for, they wanted us to kind of basically give us give our own sort of personal course, and uh, I, I wanted to do a series on great authors. Uh, so in this one, we took a look at Jack London, uh, one of my favorite authors uh, for his naturalist his uh, natural state uh, in writing. Um, so I had a handout here. Uh, first, start out with a quote by Jack London in his own words: "I would rather be ashes than dust." I'd rather that my spark should burn out in a brilliant blaze than it should be stifled by dry rot. I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent plant. planet. Uh, the proper function of man is to live, not exist. I shall not waste my days in trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. Jack London. And so I read that quote out, and then I kind of gave everybody to discuss it, or I opened it up to a discussion on what, it, what did he mean by that. Uh, do you think he was, you know, do you think uh, that is, those are words you would choose to live by? And then I had a handout here, and on the handout uh, we had some verbs to conjugate. Uh, so I have I to be born in San Francisco. This, remember, this is in his own words. So this is first person. Uh, so would be correct there. I was born, I to be a man among men. If I had a spare nickel, I to in a beer instead of candy. So I was a man among men. And if I had a spare nickel, I spent it on beer instead of candy. Because I thought it was more manly to buy beer. Now, with many years nearly to double. Double, I am out on hunt for the boyhood, which I never to have. Uh, so here we're kind of dealing with past tense. Jacqueline was talking about himself in the past tense. And I'm less serious than at any other time in my life. The second school where I, to try, tried to pick up a little learning was the regular hit, was an irregular hit or miss affair at San Mateo. Each class sat at a separate desk, but there were days when we, not to sit, didn't sit at all for the, for the master used to get drunk very often, and then one of the other boys would thrash him. Even things up, the master would then thrash the young lads so you can think what sort of school it was. So just kind of looking at the past tense, simple past tense here, and conjugating it. One of my earliest and strongest impressions was of the ignorance of other people. I, uh, to read, read, and to absorb, absorb Washington Irving's Alhambra before I, to be, was nine, but can, could never understand how it was that other ranchers knew nothing about it. Later, I concluded that this in ignorance was peculiar to the country and felt that those who lived in the cities would not be so dense. One day a man from the city came to the ranch. He wore shiny shoes and a cloth coat, and I felt that there was a good chance for me to exchange thoughts with an enlightened mind. I questioned him about the Alhambra, and he was as ignorant as the man on the ranch. And then I consoled myself with the thought that there was only two clever people in the world, should be were, uh, Washington Irving and myself. No kind of typo there. 
So we go through this, just kind of do simple, simple tense. This is Jack, and then talking about himself. Before I was 11, I left the ranch and came to Oakley, where I spent so much of my time in the free public library, eagerly reading everything that came to hand. I shipped for the mast and sailed for the Japanese coast on a sea hunting expedition, later going to the Bering Sea. After sealing for seven months, I came back to California and took odd jobs at coal and jute factories, where I worked from six in the morning until seven at night. The factory occupied 13 hours of my day. I wanted a little time for myself, though so there was little left for composition. San Francisco call for the prize and descriptive Scriptogaro. My mother urged me to try for it. And I did, taking my subject, Typhoon, off the coast of Japan. The first prize came to me. My success in the San Francisco Call competition seriously turned my thoughts to writing. My first book was published in 1900. And I think this is really kind of an important part of American history uh, because it's kind of a shared, shared sort of uh, experience uh, in, in many countries, you know, that, that working your way up. Uh, from rags to riches story, you know, kind of, uh, I think every every country I've ever been to uh, and every person I ever spoke to uh, didn't all have some sort of regards for, for the person, uh, for the work experience, of, uh, the feeling of earned something and, and working towards it and achieving an achievement. And especially, uh, you know, if it was a, you know, if it was a difficult work, if it was hard work, if people had to, had to really sort of you know, exert themselves to achieve something instead of just have it handed to them. And then we took a look at some of Jack London's books. Uh, what I did here is I scrambled up the titles. So I have Wild Bell of Call Bell. What do you think the title is? Call the Wild. And Sea South Tales. So, oh, I'm sorry. The of Men and Faith, the Faith of Men. I have uh, Sea South Tales, South Sea Tales, Fish Tales of the Patrol, Tales of the Fish Patrol, Fathers the God His of the, the God of His Fathers, Daughter A the of Snows, Daughter of the Snows, Frost the of Children the. Children of the Frost and the Son, Son of a the, the Son of the, a Son of the Sun. Some different Jack uh, Jack London stories, maybe lesser known. But I kind of want to give give uh, give uh, the students a, a sense of kind of the poeticism, of, uh, the poetics of, of Jack London. And certainly his time is really reflective of that. Then I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, literature theory here. In his writing, Jack London dismissed the realism of the upper class as the drama of a broken teacup. Discuss what do you, what do you think they mean by a broken teacup? Uh, what do you think I mean by realism? The gossips and woman, womanly manners of the upper classes were not for him. Instead, Jack London focused his writings on the harsh realities of the American life at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. Uh, London's naturalist writings featured characters in a dirty, rough landscape, struggling to stay alive in a world that did not care about them. Naturalist writing was heavily influenced by Darwin's theories on the evolution of man, so often the line between man and animal was left unclear. Uh, Jack London was a master of the naturalist writing genre and wrote some of his finest works, including the classic story of a man's uh, lone struggle to survive in Alaskan tundra called To Build a Fire. Typically a, um, typically a, a book, a short story you would read in, uh, in most American high schools. And then I kind of delved a little more into uh, you know, li literature theory. Uh, if naturalism is about the rugged individual, which of these themes is most likely not a theme in a natural story? Survival, romance, instinct, or nature? Not romance. The idea of free will and free choice in a natural st story is what? An illusion? Is it instinct? Is it part of nature? Is it survival? Is it an illusion? True or false, nature is romantic in a natural story. 
off. Not romantic at all. Most often natural stories are what? Comedies? Fairy tales? Love stories or tragedies? tragedies. And then I gave uh, each table, each group, I would give a copy of the story, short story, or most of the short story to build a fire. I kind of left it on a cliffhanger here so we could discuss what do you think happens and kind of encourage them to, to seek out the story themselves. So I made this very elaborate sort of storytelling where I would, they would listen to a section of the story and then we would discuss it and do some exercises and then I would expect them to read a section of the story. And here I have a picture, of, that's me up there, you know, up there with the St. Bernard and the <laughs> cockapoo and the store and the bike. That was me. Uh, as, as a child and down here you have Jack and his dog. Started off with some activities here. I got A, B, C, D, E, F, D, E, and, F, and G. And I have uh, some different items, and I want you to tell me which ones is which. So, which ones are old paper? A, B, C, D, E, D, E, F, or G? So, old papers are. Freezing up here. Works. Kick in. Come on. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Still waiting for it. I gotta skip over it for now. Let's see. kind of frozen here for now. Isn't up on me. B, our match is. What is C? C you have. Okay, so this is how we did it. Uh, A, is it old papers, dry twigs, birch bark, flintstone, gunpowder, matches, gasoline, or dry moss? A is gunpowder. B, matches. What do you think C is? Is it old papers, dry twigs, birch bark, flintstone, gunpowder, matches, gasoline, or dry moss? Flintstone, what do you think D is? I'm sorry, what went to E? E is old paper, what do you think D is? Gasoline, what do you think F is? Birch bark, what do you think G is? First H, dry twigs. So, uh, some problems with the uh, with the with the order of the animations there. So passage one. Please read the following passage. You know, I went to got some got some uh, photos from the uh, old uh, Alaskan gold rush. Kind of uh, used them in this presentation. So here the students would have the uh, short story in front of them. I had each section marked uh, accordingly. And I'll ask him to read passage one. Dad broken, golden crakes, and got the code day. Usually what I did is I kind of do three paragraphs and then I broke it off. Here I, I asked him to read the first uh, passage, which was just the opening paragraph, how to describe the opening. What is the mood of the opening paragraph? How does opening make you feel as a reader? And what does the man of God, how does the man of God answer? Then we moved on. Next, next paragraph. And then I had an exercise here based on some of the words in that pack, passage. If you notice, there were some of the words were under, underlined. And I just went back to take a look at them. What do you think this first one is? They have Y, N, U, K, and O. Yukon Trail. And here I have something bank. E, E, S, T, P. Steep bank. And over here I have the, what kind of gloom? Subtle gloom. 
What kind of intangible what? The intangible what? The intangible hall. Oh. And here I would also tell him what what it means. Um, Paul's kind of depression, kind of, kind of a foreboding sort of foreboding sort of atmosphere. Uh, or gray, very gray, you might even say gloom is another word for Paul. Uh, a what of sun, a hint of sun, and what kind of undulations, undulations, waves, gentle undulations of snow he's talking about. And here what I did, this was kind of one of the big tasks I did, did in ESL, they decided to actually create uh, audio uh, audio tracks for me reading a passage. So here I ask them to listen to the next passage. And all this, the mysterious far-reaching airline trail, the absence of sun from the sky, the tremendous cold and the strangeness and the weirdness of it all, made no impression on the night. It was not because it was long. passage I, I created that the entire audio passage there uh, excerpt there I did it all pretty much on audacity and, and with a little voice recorder I had at the time added in all the sound effects I, I didn't quite get it, the mix to where I, I should have had it though uh, so it, was, it wasn't as clear as I liked it but uh, you know, difficult to go back and re-edit all that in, in terms of uh, the workload that I had before me uh, to get these things out and ready for the classroom. Uh, so, uh, and what I did here is I also had the, uh, I tried to follow along as, as the class moved along, uh, as I was listening, I tried to uh, follow along because I had the, uh, the words here. And of course the students would have the words in front of them with the, um, the part uh, highlighted that they were supposed to be listening to. Thought number and I said, Turn to go spat speculatively, some words underlined.
And then I did an exercise kind of based on it. Uh, he talked a little bit about having some cold biscuits. And here I did a very easy recipe for cold biscuits to kind of sort of uh, enhance the, uh, the listening experience or the learning experience. Uh, so lunch... I'm going to try to whip up some biscuits. I have two blah blah sifted flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, four teaspoons of blah or shortening. One half, and this is a real recipe. Sift blah blah blah, blah blah blah. So, what I did here is I to introduce some words here cups, shortening, butter, bake, flour. Any more? I think that's all. And I want to put them into the recipe here. Uh, two what? Two cups, two shortening, two butter, two bake, two flour. Two cups, two so the flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, two, four tablespoons blank or shortening. What do you think? Cups, shortening, butter, bake, flour. Butter, butter, shortening, same thing. One half teaspoon of salt, about three, four cups of milk. So sift what? Once. Sift, what do you think? Sift. Flour once, measure, add baking powder and salt, and sift again. Sift means to kind of to thin, uh, to run through a sort of a sort of sorter. It kind of sorts the the flour, kind of breaks it down the big pieces of flour into smaller pieces. Mix in what? Mix in the shortening or the butter. Refer back to the ingredients. Add blank gradually. Uh, stirring until a soft dough is formed. And milk. Where's milk? I forgot to add. Uh, it's missing over here. And soft dough is formed. Slightly knead the dough for 30 seconds. Knead it to kind of to uh, roll enough to shape roll dough into a half inch thick sheet with cut two inch floured biscuit cutter. Blank on greased sheet. Bake on a greased sheet for 400 degrees for 12 minutes. 12 biscuits. So since he talked about having biscuits, cold biscuits, I wanted to introduce a quick uh, recipe there. 50 below meant precisely 50 below. Fill the sentence precisely as you hear them. One. But all this mysterious firing in the absence of... Where do I have it? Where is it? Loaded. So here I asked them to go through, uh, through the, the passage, because they had the form, and fill in the blanks. As he turned to go on, I found some around the spruce trees. And then come to passage three. Passage three, I would say, now I'd like you to read. Do the best you can. Maybe the stronger readers could help the, the um, uh, the sort of intermediate readers with beginner readers along. Uh, pictures, we go through it. Give them some, give them five minutes, give them uh, to read through this next passage. And then we come to an exercise. To which character came these thoughts? You have the dog, you have the author. And you have the man. So we had three different characters and point of views in the passage. You had the point of view of the dog, you had the point of view of the author, and you had the point of view of the man in the story. So if it, whose whose thought was this? It did not know anything about thermometers. When, when Jack London, when when the author wrote, it did not. Who was he talking about? The dog, the author, or the man? I did not know anything about thermometers. It's the dog, it's not the author. <laughs> That's wrong. Frozen tobacco spittle was a small price to pay in the cold. No one thought that. No, no, wait. Yeah, it was, it was the author who thought that was his thought. Maybe it did know. <laughs> Maybe the dog did, didn't know about thermometers. He was speaking for the dog. Four miles an hour was good time. No one thought that. It was a good idea to build a fire or burrow into the snow for warmth. 
was the dog's thought. The man's judgment was poor next to the dog's instinct. The author. That was kind of a trick question there. The first one. <laughs> and then the dog. So a little bit about the dogs. Uh, leash up the vocabulary words to the correct definitions. Match and match. So over here I got some words. I got moisture, apprehension, instinct, expel, and amber. And over here I have the definitions. So just kind of match them up. You have a fear or worry about the future, to force out or drive away, a yellowish brown color, a wetness or small amount of water, any natural skill or impulse. Moisture is a wetness or small amount. What do you think apprehension is? Fear or worry about the future. What do you think instinct is? Any natural skill or impulse. What do you think to expel something is? Force to drive away. What do you think amber is? The yellowish or brown color. From their next passage, and here uh, I ask them to listen. In 12 o'clock, the day was at its brightest, yet the sun was too f Let's try again. Turn it up there. In 12 o'clock, the day was at its brightest, yet the sun was too far south on its winter journey to clear the horizon. The bulge of the earth Passage. Go through it, follow along as we listen. I can't really do it in the here now because uh, it kind of falls out of it. It would cancel the, the audio if we were doing it as we went. Then we come to another trail marker, some of those underlying, pat, underlying words in the passage. Something of the, world, of the earth, anything that was, is the bold of the earth. Sharp what? The sharp what? Sharp smashes. What a great, what a great, what a great sort of phrase there. Sharp smashes. Ice what? Ice muzzle. Uh, hmm, ow. 
hmm, the thaw out and the hmm, up and down, it stamped up and down. And what kind of creek was it? It's a sulfur creek. I want to ask if anybody knows what sulfur is. It's a mineral water. It smells like rat milk. We're barking about it. All right, so we're talking about dogs. Here, I just wanted to do some vocabulary around dogs, different breeds of dogs. One no, no kind of dog out there. Uh, you have a Chinook, a Spruce, a Labrador, a Newfoundland, a Hemlock, a St. Bernard, Birch, Cedar, and Malamute, and Alder. All right, so over here on the left side, you see different kinds of trees, different kinds of pines, really. And over here, you have different kinds of dogs. I want you to tell me which is a dog and which is a tree. Which is a Chinook? What is a tree? What is a dog? Chinook. Is that a tree or dog? It's a dog. Sit down here in the right kind of corner. Chinook. What is a spruce? Is it a tree or dog? Barker bite. Barker bite. <laughs> Over here on the left. It's a tree. Where's a lab bear? Is it a dog or a tree? Barker bite. Bite, laboratory, one of the right. Newfoundland, Barker Bite. Dog, one of the right. Hemlock, Barker Bite. R, <laughs> Hemlock. St. Bernard. Dog, one of the right. Birch. Tree, Cedar. Tree, Malamute. Dog, Alder. Tree. Once again, this is you know, this is quite advanced for uh, English proficiency, so this is something you reserve for you know, English corners or advanced students, mean university students. So. Passage five. I've got some pictures from the gold rush. There's probably the biggest uh, biggest rock of gold that that's been found, and uh, over here you have some. Uh, one of the camps down there. It's actually a, a bar or something else. <laughs> so here the students would read the passage, give them some time, just kind of read through it. If you have a really strong student, you might even ask them to read uh, for the class. Man, God, and die. On the other hand, there is no keen intimacy between the dog and the man. So we just a quick little discussion how's the relationship between the man and the dog discussed at first. What did the dog instinctively understand that the man did not? And how does the man and dog's relationship symbolize the man's relationship to his environment? And so how is the, the relationship between the man and the dog kind of relationship uh, reflect on the man's relationship between him and his environment? Once again, we go back to Brain Freeze, which character uh, came these thoughts, who thought this, the dog, the author of the man, the man did not know cold, this was the dog, the dog was merely a kind of slave, it was kind of the authors reflecting on the relationship, the creek trail was safe, and the man thought that, thought that, the man was menacing, the dog thought that, the man's judgment was poor, and that's the dog's instinct, this was the author. Breaking the ice, match up the events from the past. Alright, so here we have some events. The high water of the spring. It has covered all the signs of water beneath the icy crust. The man finished his pipe. The dog's ancestry, the dog's ancestry experiences 100 more below zero temperatures. The snow of the winter has fallen so heavily, the snow looks solid and convincing. So see, the high, the high water of the spring leaves seasoned twigs in the undergrowth. The man finishes his pipe, see, then heads up the left fork of the creek trail. The dog's ancestry experiences 107 below zero temperatures. So B, and so it yearns to stay by the fire. The snow of winter has fallen so heavily It has covered all the signs of winter beneath the icy crust. The snow looks solid and convincing, but gives way beneath the man's feet. Listening to the next passage. You as I 
stuff there, a lot of that I did myself, I, you know, recording the sounds of uh, walking through the snow, and uh, the winds were just kind of tracks I found, but uh, um, were stock tracks, but uh, so a lot of that I did myself and, and added in there. Unfortunately, I didn't get a decent mix out of it, so I'd have to go back. I originally did the whole story, so I, I did the entire audio story myself. And, uh, and then I kind of broke it up in, into sections to try and to, uh, to make it go a little bit quicker. And I would do this presentation, the whole story, over maybe three weeks uh, with a certain class. Read the trail. It is quite So here are some words from the passage in parallel gravity of time that was still in circulation. It is quite. Paragraph that the set all standing, the dog's hair was a wild entanglement of frizzy hair. Took the electric company all night to restore power to our home. Exercise good for the circulation of the day. He readily agreed with the proposal. And Quinn the Inuit, Eskimos, part of the Alaskan uh, sort of culture. I uh, write the words in the correct order to make sentences from the passage. So you got slow and carefully, keenly aware he worked up his danger. Look in the passage for the word, the sentence. He worked slow and carefully, keenly aware. They are fair, he knew no must be. He knew there must be no fair. It was angry, his luck, and cursed he. He was angry and cursed his loud. By touching the match to him, tread, he got birch bark. The flame he got by touching your match this morning. So I'm just kind of trying to give the students kind of an idea of, of, of sort of writing, um, you know, in different ways you can use phrases and, uh, and words and different, uh, different uh, combinations, different sequences, complex sentences. I uh, really want the students to kind of focus on all that with this advanced course. That's one to read. 
students are turning over the students to read. Maybe a you know one of the better students you can can read. Maybe do each you know if you have a number of students who can read at this level, give them the same a paragraph to read. Get all these backgrounds, the birch bark and the burnt paper, and, um, all the font there. Just took a lot of time to put this together. And so we get to the end of it. And here I cut it short um, for this one um, for this one training center. Once again, if I was working in the university, I might do this over three weeks and do the whole story. Um, but for here, I was kind of trying to do. Um, a, uh, you know, every week I wanted, or every month I wanted to do a different author. Um, and I ended it there, not at the end of the story, but I ended it here and because it ends with the story of, of him having to build a fire and so, and with it, uh, uh, he built, he builds it under a, uh, a tree with, a uh, over branches are overhanging it with snow and he didn't pay attention to that and he built this fire here kind of his last matches he's in a tough situation where he has fallen in some water and if he doesn't get this fire built he uh, stands to freeze to death so I wanted it there where he builds this fire under the branches um, and uh, asks the students there what do you how do you think it ends and uh, with that I kind of give them the, the copies of the story that they can take home and finish it if they like and find out how it does end but we have a quick little discussion on how they and that's my presentation on uh, Jack London. I also did one on Hans Christian Andersen, a story of the Nightingale. Uh, maybe if I get a chance, I'll, I'll load that up here. I also did Mark Twain, the jumping the the uh, jumping frog of Calaveras County, also. Uh, but that's all uh, for this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you can get some ideas out of, out of here. If you do, please let me know in the comment section below. Uh, other than that, uh, please click like and subscribe. Uh, and uh, let me know if uh, you appreciate this contest. But uh, thanks for watching, and we will talk to you later.